Welcome everyone, I'm Laura DeFranco, the CEO of Brave Healer Productions, where we have a mission to wake the world up to what's possible, one brave word at a time. And here today to help me with that mission are a couple of the most amazing authors of a new book that we have coming out. This one is called Rites and Rituals, Harnessing the Power of Sacred Ceremony. Before I introduce these wonderful, powerful, amazing women to you today, I wanna say a huge thank you to our lead author, Ariana Platten. Ariana, um, awesome, awesome mission and vision, powerful vision for what you wanted this book to be. And I'm so honored to be guiding this project with all of the amazing experts that you brought in to talk about this topic. Thank you so much. We would not be here without you. So who do I have with me today? I have Reverend Ashura Allen, who is the CEO of Awakened Heart Healing Arts, where she offers in-person and virtual healing sessions and transformational containers to align with and embody spirit and radiant health. I also have Liz Gold Lerner with me, the founder of Your Inspired Choices and the Enlightened Communication Institute, which helps individuals and organizations express their true purpose. Welcome, ladies. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. So, Thank you. Ashra, you're up first. Tell us about this amazing chapter that you wrote. So my chapter is chapter 12. And it's entitled Conscious Parenting Ceremonies, Raising the Next Generation of Earth-Centered, Spiritually Aligned Children. And I wrote this chapter because I realized that I had raised a child in community and that I was really blessed to be able to say that and that it occurred to me many people don't have that and are hungry for it and that that's really our origins. We were all at one point, if we go far enough back, we were all in a village, a tribe, a community, and we didn't do this solo. And I think particularly in the time of COVID, uh, for parents who found themselves extraordinarily isolated at times where they oughtn't to have been, that it is really important to acknowledge that pain and also to really explore how do we connect and raise our children alongside other people And how did those people help us to mark those really momentous occasions in our child's life, both for the support of the child and the parent? I love the power of this. I'm thinking about my own kiddos and whether or not even they know they've been raised in community, they have been. Like there's been this energy and power of the Brave Healer community behind my kids the entire time. And when we reach out to our community, even just to ask for help uh, or ask for a prayer or whatever, the, the, ooh, I'm I'm giving my own self goosebumps about it right now. Like you just feel the energy of it and it's so much more powerful. Tell tell me more about that. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, for me, the power of being witnessed in life's transitions is so momentous because we're all really mirrors for each other. And without that reflection, we don't always see ourselves, I would say appropriately or in our wholeness. And so that's one of the biggest gifts of community is being able to see ourselves in a multifaceted way, which is the nature of our existence. And we were put here on earth together um, as much as I think it's important to have self-love and really be okay if you're alone and all of that. By the same token, um, we really were here, put here to enjoy one another and to let each other be a part of our own spiritual unfolding. I am scribbling that down because that was a little moment for me. We were put here together. We weren't we weren't put here alone. You know, there's a lot written and said about belonging and the reason we're here is to connect and belong. But but I think you said it the best when, yes, there's the self-love piece. Yes, that's important too. And there's this other thing that, you know, that we should think about. And that's the fact that we were put here together. Anything else you want to say about that? 
I think that I'd like to give a big nod um, and shout out to the community that really helped me raise my child, the Earth Spirit community. And along that vein, we were just saying um, the Earth Spirit community was formed in 1977, and they're an Earth centered spiritual community that is also building culture and connection through pre Christian indigenous European practices. And I think that many of us are out of touch with our origins and that when we find our people, when we find the people that see the world in the way that we do, we step more fully into our, again, our wholeness and our expression. And like you said, our sense of belonging. And so I think for those who maybe don't belong to a church, but really are yearning for community, it's important that we find that community. And I, I love that people have churches and spiritual communities inside of those organizations, but for some people, that's not what resonates for them. And they're hungry. They're really hungry for that sense of belonging. So um, I think it's imperative that people know that there are communities out there for, for each of us, that we all have a place where we belong and can feel fully like it's okay to be entirely who we are, to love who we love, to express how we express. And we all deserve to, to have that. Thank you for being here, Ashra. All right, Liz, tell us about your amazing chapter. There are so many things that Ashra said that I want to talk about. <laughs> um, my chapter is chapter 22, a right, R-I-T-E, to breathe, ceremony as a road to sovereignty. So... I just want to talk for a second about the title because um, it's really a double, I don't know if double entendre is the right word, but you know, a right to the right, the right of passage, the right to ceremony, the right that we take action to make a intentional transformational change in our lives. And also the right that we have the right to breathe we have the right to do and be and say and mark those transitions and think moments of importance and value to ourselves and at, by extension to our community because when we in, involve people in our um, transformation or in our major life event then it resonates you know, not only in our community, but like the universe. <laughs> so my book is about, I mean, my uh, chapter is about um, moving from marriage to divorce and um, the process of bringing my uh, own transformation into my women community and creating a ritual around that. And one of the things that, that Asha said that really spoke to me was that when I used, I had a, a program called Creating Rites of Passage and Ritual, which after doing this book, I might reactivate. <laughs> um, but what I found is that uh, the women in that program, there were never any um, ways to mark all of these really special, important things that go on in our lives besides births and deaths in our culture. And when we looked at what people really wanted to do to express and how they would create those rituals, um, it was all pre-organized uh, religion pieces. Right. I mean, there were things that came from organized religion, but in a way, but, you know, people burying placentas and people, um, you know, washing hands for for, you know, purity and, you know, just all these different pieces that we have in our, well, burying your placenta is not in your everyday life, but, <laughs> but, but everyday life things that um, are sacred and not noticed. And so um, a piece of my chapter is about how do you actually create um, a ritual for yourself that um, takes in all these 
you know, how do you create what's special to you and how do you mark a transition in your life? Um, so anyway, I, I, I hope I didn't go too off there, but. Awesome, no, you didn't. Yeah, and the, what you said about your title for your chapter is just making me think about something um, which is standing tall inside of your worthiness to mm-hmm. use, you know, right to breathe. It's like, yes. Mm-hmm. And it, I mean, I think that can take a while for people to finally be standing up tall mm-hmm. in the middle of their own worthiness to even say, I have a right to, and then fill in the blank. Anything right. else you want to say about that? You know, if I look at it in the context of, of the chapter of divorce and, and moving forward in, in one's life, um, I think there are a lot of things that, uh, make us all feel like we don't have the right. I have to take care of my child. I have to take care of this. I have, you know, what are the finances? What are the, you know, all the different kind of practical and loving things that we do that put ourselves last and to be able to move through that process and say, okay, um, actually health, um, you know, uh, joy, um, alignment, uh, my own purpose are all equally as important. And so we stand up with that right. The other thing is involving the community in that because um, one of the things that we did or I did was to um, really share with the community the intention of how we wanted to do this. So um, having a separation party and um, you know, showing that we were reforming our family instead of having a war meant that the community could get behind us and speak about it in a way that was entirely different than people would normally think about. So bringing the community in to also support that right, that, that okay, we get to be whoever we are. We get to be different. We get to change. We have the power to do that. No matter what the collective consciousness or unconscious says about our lives. Um, so Thank you. right, right is important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, say the least, I think. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So um, I'm going to stick with you, Liz, for this next question that I have for both of you. And I was uh, telling you a little bit about it earlier when uh, before we were recording this, but I've really noticed the profound effect that sacred rituals have had in my own life, especially recently. It's not just those big events that you think of ceremony for, like you mentioned, you know, birth and death and weddings, um, whatever, but it can be in the purposeful intention that you put into your morning routine, your cup of coffee, literally, right? So, what has sacred ceremony or ritual meant in your own personal life in terms of the the smaller moment? It's a really good question. Um, I think the most important part about um, ritual is the intentionality of being present in the moment. So for me, continuing to remind myself to be here now, appreciate what's in front of me, what I'm smelling, what I'm seeing, what I'm doing, the people I'm interacting with in that moment. We don't always think of that as a ritual or a a rite, but um, to keep coming back to that has meant for me, that I come back to neutrality and I'm always choosing or as much as possible (laughs) choosing in the moment, what I'm doing, how, how aware I am of my interaction with someone. So having, I'm not saying that it's that I have been able to, in every moment of my life, um, be that conscious. But having the intention of being that conscious is a sacred right. 
So if I get to choose, then I, I am um, really mindful of how I'm affecting everyone around me. And that makes a really big difference. Um, oh and also gosh, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> yes. I mean, right. If you think difference. like I have my fabulous coffee in my, in my life is good cup. Right. So it's like <laughs> that in itself is a ritual, right? I love to make my coffee. I love to put it in my life is good cup. I like to have that intention <laughs> for the day. <laughs> it can like be little, you know, <laughs> it, it can. Yeah. That was one of the points of that question it can be in any little moment. Ashra, what do you want to say in terms of this? What would you add? Like, what has this meant to you personally in that day-to-day life of yours? Absolutely. I so appreciate this question because I can definitely hearken it back to some of the attention that I wrote my chapter with about the consciousness of the earth itself and this idea that the earth itself is the mystery And that the earth itself, if we follow the trajectory of animism, is imbued with spirit itself and that the earth itself has a consciousness and is alive. So part of my daily ritual is to engage with and have communion with the spirit of the earth. And so when I let the dog out in the morning, I take that moment to really breathe in the earth and to notice the spirit of the trees and the sky and the earth and really take that in, but actually have communion with the earth. And I think that in raising our children, particularly in lieu of climate disaster and destruction, if we have a generation or generations or just humanity as a whole, thinking that it is separate from its source or thinking that the earth is not sacred or imbued with a consciousness, then how much easier is it for us to continue to lay waste and destruction to something that is separate from us? So that daily communal practice is that engagement and recognition that we are not just living on the earth, we are the earth. And that when we have that knowledge that we are the earth, we are much less likely to destroy it. And then we can work in tandem with it to find the answers that we need for the times that we find ourselves living in. And as a parent, um, that's absolutely requisite in my heart because I will never surrender hope for my daughter's future or the future of generations that are coming up behind me. And if I don't engage with the earth in a conscious manner, I'm surrendering that hope. So um, so yes, the, the daily rituals that don't have to be the big mile markers in life, but it's also that intention of imbuing the most mundane of moments with the sacred. Yes. Oh my gosh. It's, um, um, this is such a powerful topic for so many <laughs> reasons. I love listening to you both talk about what matters to you in it. And we, so we, author experts like to talk about ourselves more as guides and facilitators on this journey. We know that we don't fix people. We know that nothing's broken, Um, but we empower people to connect with their own inner wisdom. And that's, I think, how you all have been guiding in these beautiful chapters where you're laying out an authentic real story about who you are and how you got to being passionate about what you do today. But then you guys were, were giving you some practices and strategies and tools and um, ways that you can practice. And Liz and Ashra have given you examples of like how they look at that sacred ritual in their own lives in these wonderful small ways, right? So the book is going to be full of these things that you guys can read and do right there with with the book with the beautiful words on the page but um ashra i want to stay with you for this this next one about em- helping empower people what do you want our listeners to know about their own inner wisdom i know this is a big question but what's that one thing you'd like them to know about that Well, I think if we focus on that question of how do we connect with our own inner wisdom, 
I think many times when we have an inspiration, we think that it's coming from outside of ourselves. And many times it is. Um, we talk about spirit connections and guides, guardians, angels, benevolent ancestors, and that's all absolutely accessible and real. And it's coming through the filter of our own divine nature. It's coming from our own higher self. And we are all spiral iterations of that great divine. And if we really accept that to be true, then that source connection is us. And so we always have access to that higher wisdom because it is us. It's not separate from us, just as we are not separate from the earth. So this, you know, every so much of what I talk about is about union all the way down through all our iterations and expressions of life that we really are in harmony and union with source. There's, um, I love, uh, I love reminding people that they are that source. And I sometimes I have to remind myself every day, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think the reminders are a good thing, especially when you're going through something very difficult or things are not going very well for you that day or that month or that year. I'm like, remember your power, y'all. And it's like right here for you every single day. Um, Liz, what do you want to add to that? What's what do you want our listeners to understand about connecting to that inner wisdom? So I would I would say ditto to pretty <laughs> much everything Ashra said, which I think is really important because I think there are so many of us really tuning into the fact that we do have that wisdom. We do get it on all levels. Um I think what I what I want to share with our readers is that it isn't hard to connect to it. That we think a lot of things are harder than they are. And then that sets up a barrier to connecting. But if we allow ourselves to let that mental energy just drop into the heart and listen instead of think and just trust that what we're hearing is our own wisdom and get used to building that muscle of just allowing and practicing and kind of seeing if it, you know, you can test it out even <laughs> um, to get reassurance, but that when we really breathe and feel into every level of our body, which again, with our intention, we don't have to know exactly how to do it. Then we find that we find it. It's right there. It's always right there for us. I love that you said it doesn't have to be hard. It can actually be easy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I like reminding people of that as well. Um, okay. You, you don't really know how perfect your answer was to slide into this next thing I want you to talk about, <laughs> which you, you kind of gave it up a little bit, but you know, and I'm going to keep, keep this one with you first, Liz, feeling is, is healing and feeling is an awareness practice. So it's everything you talked about in, in a lot of your answers today spoke to this. So helping people to feel and practice is part of this for me. It's part of all the books. It's part of everything that we do even in writing and connecting as an author and deciding what we want to talk about and help people with. But if I was um, a fly on the wall of your home, how, <laughs> what, what would I see in terms of one of the personal ways you connect and practice in that, in that awareness in your day to day? Give us a, a little window. Well, I'm sorry I didn't bring my little crystal <laughs> to our screen. <laughs> um, you would see beauty. You would see earth. So lots of plants, lots of beauty, lots of connection to, um, I guess as Asha spoke about, the whatever you know things from the ocean whatever connects me to the earth and to source 
what I consider source. So again, that alignment of energies. So flowers, plants, art, um, softness, you know, crystals. I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> I love it. I love the way that you're answering it. I, you're making me chuckle because a lot of the interviews, I don't have one right here, but a lot of the authors will be like crystal show and tell, you know, immediately because they have them like right. on their desks and things. Right. Mine are it's behind beautiful. Me. It's like there's this little, this, <laughs> this got crystal guide that has been with me. And I share actually with another human who doesn't live with me. We pass it back and forth, but it's guided us on our um, kind of spiritual journeys and journeys of service and individual journeys. So it's really, um, I think what's hard about your question actually is that it's unseen. So there are things that will symbolize or represent that all of us can bring into our homes, but the actual, um, you said feeling is healing. <laughs> you know, the actual feeling of alignment isn't necessarily it seen outside of us, right? Like yeah. we might, if we if we have certain gifts, we might be able to see certain things <laughs> that you know help us know we're you know connecting to something, but. That I can actually talking about it, I can feel things starting to light up inside, right? Kind of this sensation of energy moving, or you know, having that um, it's such a feeling thing as well as a symbolic thing. And I think we do need the symbolic sometimes to bring us to the feeling, like the scent, you know, the incense, the rose petals, the, the, um, the stones, the circle that we create to create sacred space or stuff like that. And one of the things that I was thinking when Asha was speaking and then when you asked this question was that in the chapters, there are so many ways to bring people to that sacred space and teach us all, like I've learned things from other people's chapters, you know, to, to create, you know, that visual that brings us to the connective tissue inside and with the universe. So I think it's like a, a huge, like aesthetic teaching, practical tool, the, the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> For sure is. <laughs> and I, I love the way you're talking about the the connection and it's nice to have a window into um, that personal practice. I'm going to butt in with mine before I ask you, Ashura, you know, if you were peeking in my window in the morning, you would see me light a candle and sit down in a particular room that I have curated for energy where mm -hmm. my notebooks sit and I will journal thoughts or inspirations or whatever that is in the morning and that's part writing duh you know you're you're talking to uh the person who is all about the writing but the writing is the way i meditate the writing is the way i connect the writing is the channel for me so once upon a time i decided that i was meditating correctly because there was this thought that you know oh is this is this the right way to no yes this this is the right way to do it for me and then that that moment just gave me full permission to that was my way and that it's a powerful way. So if you if you peeked in my window, you'd see that writing specifically handwriting on notebooks and journals is one of the ways that I practice awareness and connect to that inner wisdom and the messages moving through. Um, so Ashra. How about you? What if we peeked into your window? 
If you peeked into my window, you would see a little of the same that you described, Laura, of lighting a candle. And there's a daily spiritual practice that I'm engaged in. There's a glass of water and there are litanies, things that I say that anchor me into my spiritual center. And writing is also one of my daily practices as well. And I would say that the whole thing that you were mentioning about feeling is healing. I really wanted to take that ball and run with it because that is a part of my daily practice is a full allowance of my feelings. And I think that sometimes we can uphold a certain degree of stoicism, uh, some cultures more than others. And to me, this is really detrimental because we also tend to relegate some feelings into like this idea that there are negative feelings. And I don't think that there are. I think that our feeling capacity is the full expression of our humanity. And that when we think about rites and ceremonies and rituals, a feeling is a tantamount aspect of that. What are we evoking? What are we intending to evoke? What are we creating a safe container to be you know, expressed within. So if we're having a grief ceremony, we need to create that safe container for grief to be fully expressed. Right. And in the culture of the West, boy, do we like to suppress uh, certain emotions, grief being one of them. And we, we tend to do that in isolation, whereas most places in the world, grief is absolutely a ceremonially held in community. Uh, there are certain emotions that because of their strength and tenacity, need to be held in containers that have other people, other open hearts, witnessing, surrounding, holding, and also equally expressing with us. And when we have multiple people, there's power in numbers that are latching into and expressing the same feeling, then it can be extremely cathartic. And it's it's cathartic for the overlighting spirit of a community or of a planet or of a, a a village right that we are collectively experiencing traumas not just individually so that healing can't just happen one-on-one -on -one. sometimes the healing has to happen in community and so my daily practices actually are bringing that individual awareness out into the world where do i see what i am going through mirrored to me in the collective where do i see what i'm going through mirrored to me in the earth and that to me points where my intention and where my focus for my healing work is for that day. Beautiful. Um, you guys realize we could have taken any one of the questions and talked for about three hours on each of them today. <laughs> um, Ashra Allen and Liz Goldlerner, thank you both. Thank you ladies so much for what you do in the world and for being here today to share it with everyone. Thank you. So to our listeners today, you know, maybe something that Liz or Ashura said has given you the goosebumps and you're curious and just drop down into the show notes because I have their websites there. They are very generously there for you to carry on the conversation, to answer a question, to give you that support. So go explore. They're up to a lot of awesomeness in the world. <laughs> And remember also to join us for our book launch party. That's going to be Saturday, February 18th, 10 a.m. Eastern. I'm going to gather with all of the Rites and Rituals authors. We're going to be doing some fun giveaways that day, and you're going to find the Zoom invitation on the Brave Healer Productions Facebook page. I've got the info below for you. If you happen to be listening anytime around that date of February, that also means you can hop over to Amazon at that point and grab your copy of this amazing book. Like, what if there's something you haven't learned yet that could change everything? That is this book, you guys. And lastly today, remember everyone, your words change the world when you're brave enough to share them. So it's time to be brave. See you next time, everyone. Bye, ladies.